Hello everybody and welcome back to The Ultimate Fashion History with me, Amanda Halley. And in this episode we'll be looking at one of my all-time favourite stars, the lovely Lana Turner. We'll look at her rise to stardom, how she found her image, her position as a genuine 20th century style icon, and then I want to talk about Lana Turner not as a star, but as a woman, and I'll tell you just some of the things that I learned about her that simply made me fall in love with her. Before we start, just to remind you that I don't do comments here, but you can write to me directly through my website, I'll leave a link, or better yet, join our Facebook group, I'll leave a link to that too. And speaking of the Ultimate Fashion History Facebook group, the other day I posted a picture of Lana Turner and a wonderful group member said to me, Amanda, I never really got Lana Turner. And I love this because up until quite recently, I never really got Lana Turner either. I mean, I knew she was a legendary Hollywood beauty, and I loved her in The Postman Always Rings Twice, but it's not like I'd seek out Lana Turner movies or anything. Oh, what a fool I had been. And then, about five years ago, everything changed when I rewatched Imitation of Life, and this changed everything for me. What a screen presence, what a tremendous actress, what a wonderful wardrobe by Jean-Louis. And of course, this was 1959, so we have an older Lana here. Although she was only 38 at the time, 38 was an older woman in the 1950s, and I had just turned 50 and was looking for some older women role models. And then I found Lana, I found my girl, and it set me down a rabbit hole of frenzied Lana reading. And of course, I also had to whip out a Fay Film fashion episode on Imitation of Life. I'll leave a link to that too, in case you'd like to see it. Anyway, I told you I started reading and reading and reading everything I could get my hands upon concerning Lana Turner. And I'm so, so glad that I did, because I started with her autobiography, Lana, The Lady, The Legend, The Truth. And it's honestly my favorite Golden Age movie star autobiography. Well, second only to My Way of Life by Joan Crawford, obviously, which reminds me, image searching for this episode, I happened upon this. I wonder what they're talking about. Perhaps Joni is warning dear Lana of the social dangers of serving warm hors d'oeuvres on cold platters. And if you've read My Way of Life, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. I then read Detour by Lana's daughter, Cheryl Crane. Evidently, when Cheryl told her mother she was writing it, Lana said, you're not going to pull a mummy dearest on me, are you? As if Cheryl adored her mother. And she also wrote this, which is one of my favorite books, Lana, the memories, the myths, the movies. It's a huge and sumptuous coffee table book that basically tells you everything you need to know about Miss Turner, from her films to her faves, all of it beautifully illustrated with hundreds and hundreds of images of LT. The more I learned about Lana Turner, the more I came to admire and respect her, and my whole Lana odyssey left me wondering this. Why Lana doesn't seem to get the love that this legend deserves? I mean, everybody still loves and reveres Joni, and my girl Bet, and the wonderful Judy, and the incredible Elizabeth, and the fabulous Marilyn, and elegant Grace, and Audrey seems to be even more beloved today than she was when she was alive. So I wondered why Lana doesn't seem to inspire the same interest, and I really think she should, as her life had just as much drama and tragedy and glamour as anybody else's. She may have had more love as a child than Joan Crawford, but this little girl, born Julia Jean Turner in 1921, Idaho, grew up dirt poor in the Great Depression, living nomadically and raised by a single mother. And the reason her mother was single was because she was widowed. 
Lana was only nine years old when her father was murdered on his way home from a craps game. He'd won big and it seemed he was followed from the game onto the street and bludgeoned to death. One shoe and one sock were missing from the body, clearly some kind of gangland message. His murder remains unsolved and of course this wasn't the only time that homicide would feature in Lana Turner's life. We all know of her liaison with mobster Johnny Stompinato and his fatal stabbing at her Hollywood home. And the fact that Lana, who famously said she'd rather lose a precious earring than be seen in public without makeup, appeared in court in defense of her teenage daughter, Cheryl, wearing no makeup, speaks volumes to the trauma this usually perfectly maquillaged star was going through. Elizabeth Taylor married seven times, twice to the same man, of course, but so did Lana Turner, seven husbands, eight weddings. Lana believed in marriage, and although she was a siren, she was basically a good Midwestern girl at heart who believed in happily ever afters, even though her happily ever after found her happily single. We all know the legend that Lana was discovered sipping a soda at Schwab's drugstore while skipping a typing class in high school, but in fact, this is only partially true. She was actually discovered in a drugstore called The Top Hat, a little detail that Lana never forgot, and she was actually a little bit cheesed off that Schwab's got so much publicity over the years because of this fictitious connection with the star, but discovered she was. She was put under contract to Warner when she was only 16 years old, and she's barely recognisable as Lana Turner here, isn't she? Yet she didn't stay unrecognised for long, because it was in her very first movie that she grabbed Hollywood's attention. Playing a teenage murder victim in 1937's They Won't Forget, all the newly named Lana really did was to strut down a street. But she strutted wearing a skin-tight sweater, which earned her the moniker, The Sweater Girl. Sweater girls became a stereotype, but Lana was the archetype, and she absolutely hated it. She felt it was humiliating, which of course it is, The Sweater Girl, and she was happy to move to MGM in the same year. Louis B. Mayer put her under contract as a favour to director Mervyn Leroy, who had just moved from Warner to MGM. But Louis B. Mayer was certain, quote, that she wouldn't amount to anything, end quote. How wrong he was, but hey, at least he doubled her Warner salary from $50 to $100 a week. But what was he going to do with her? Well, not this. A walk-on part as an Asian maid in 1938's The Adventures of Marco Polo? Better parts would follow as one of Mickey Rooney's love interests in the incredibly popular Love Finds Andy Hardy, where she actually got a title credit billing. But then she was delegated to MGM's B-movies like Dr. Kildare and The Dancing Coed, and some of her performances even ended up on the cutting room floor or ended up uncredited. Young pretty and fresh-faced, lovely though she was, MGM really struggled to find an image for her, and it's interesting to see how often she was made over to look like existing stars. She was a teenage girl who could sing and dance, right? So maybe she's the next Judy Garland, but she's also a beautiful girl. Maybe she's the next Hedy Lamarr. Look at how they have styled Lana to look as much like Hedy as possible. Or perhaps she's the next Rita Hayworth. Poor Lana was hurtled from one look to another as the studio tried desperately to find the perfect screen image for her. Which did happen, and happen it did, just in time for her 1941 breakout role in the Judy Garland and Hedy Lamarr vehicle, The Ziegfeld Girl. Wow. With her newly platinumed hair and highly arched brows, Lana had gone from innocent ingenue to sultry siren. And just to remind you how much MGM had changed her, take a look at this publicity shot from just a couple of years before. And suddenly, the studio realized that she wasn't just another pretty face. She was absolutely gorgeous, with an alabaster beauty that could rival any of the studio's leading screen goddesses. 
And when Lana walked down those stairs in the big production number of 1941's Ziegfeld Girl, the world and Louis B. Mayer knew that they had a star on their hands. And through the first half of the 40s, Lana starred in a lot of big movies in almost every genre, from horror to thrillers to romances. And although now she was a star, she was a sort of gun for hire at MGM. It wasn't until 1946 that she got the role that would catapult her into the world of the bona fide golden age Hollywood legend. In the screen adaptation of James M. Kane's noir thriller, The Postman Always Rings Twice, Lana dazzled as cold-hearted killer Cora, the quintessential film noir femme fatale, seductive and manipulative with a heart of stone. It was a role that Lana was initially reluctant to take, but later in life she cited it as her favourite movie and was very proud of her performance in it, as well she should have been. And it wasn't just the moxie she displayed in her performance that got people talking. Her nearly all-white wardrobe by Irene, coupled with her platinum hair, inverted the stereotypical idea that baddies wear black and good guys wear white. And this played delightful havoc in the minds of an audience as MGM's good girl Lana, dressed in virginal white, embodied one of the most evil screen presences in Hollywood history. And it takes a magnificent acting talent to pull this off, and Lana finally proved that she was so much more than just a gorgeous face and perfect figure. Yet, bizarrely, for the rest of the 40s and most of the 50s, Lana was given roles that weren't equal to her talent at all, but that would change in 1957 when Lana won the coveted role of Constance McKenzie in the screen version of the pop boiler bestseller, Peyton Place. And Lana's performance with such emotional nuance and depth earned the actress an Oscar nomination. She didn't win, she didn't expect to, but said the evening was one of the most magical of her life. And who did this romance-driven woman take as her date on Oscar night? She took her teenage daughter, Cheryl. More outstanding performances would follow, starting with the heart-wrenching Douglas Sirk movie Imitation of Life in 1959. Her performance was outstanding, and if anyone wanted to prove to Hollywood that a star could still sizzle while playing a woman old enough to have a teenage daughter, it was lovely Lana, who looked absolutely radiant. She looked equally gorgeous in 1966 when she broke our hearts playing Madam X. And while some of these films have been dismissed as glossy tearjerkers, it's Lana's performance that makes us cry. She really was so much better than she was ever given credit for. As with many other Golden Age Hollywood lady legends, Lana did her share of Grand Dame Guignol, also known as Psycho Biddy or Hagsploitation, most notably in 1969 with The Big Cube, a psychedelic shambles that Lana enjoyed watching in later life for its comic value. But it was in the 80s that Lana made a spectacularly glamorous comeback. As Jacqueline in Falcon Crest, Lana's episodes were always the highest rated, which is perhaps why she was booted from the show. Falcon Crest's Doyen, Jane Wyman, was evidently quite envious of Lana's popularity and maybe a little jealous of her glamour too. Lana's last on-screen role was at the age of 64 in 1985 in a Love Boat special. And look at her, so poised, so groomed, so refined, so Lana. Her very last appearance on screen was in 1994 in an interview shortly before her death. And although she was terribly ill with cancer, she radiates the intelligence and warmth and downright good Midwestern common sense that guided her through her incredible life. Well, now that we've looked at her career, let me tell you why I think Lana is a genuine 20th century style icon. I always say that what makes somebody a style icon isn't the clothes that they wear, nor how beautiful they are. 
it's their relationship to fashion, and Lana had a terrific relationship to fashion. Even at a young age, Lana loved clothes, she loved fashion, she loved discussing clothes, and she enjoyed designing them. She also loved painting, by the way. Lana may have been a clothes horse, but she was never a fashion victim, and she traversed the 20th century fashion landscape with effortless ease, making each decade her own, be it the 30s, as we have here, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and beyond. She never struggled with fashion's ephemeral trends. She took them on, but made them her own, and she also made them age-appropriate. And her on-screen style genuinely inspired imitation. She was an original style influencer, be it in her sweater girl persona, or as a wartime pinup, or a midriff-bearing, turban-wearing femme fatale, or my favorite, the chic matriarch. She took couture to the suburbs in 1961's Bachelor in Paradise, and in her much-publicized million-dollar wardrobe of Love Has Many Faces, she showed women in their 40s how to do the swinging 60s while still looking groomed and age-appropriate. She did exactly the same in the big cube, and oh, doesn't she look pretty? And the glamorous, well-groomed later Lana proved an inspiration to the Golden Girl generation. And by the way, the Golden Girls was one of Lana's favorite shows. Yet perhaps the person that Lana Turner's style influenced the most will come as a surprise to you, as she was a 20th century style icon in her own right. In the 1940s, Eva Peron was evidently obsessed with Lana Turner and based her pre-Dior wardrobe upon her Hollywood idol. Here's Lana, and here's Eva. Not convinced yet? Check this out. Here's Lana, and here's Eva. Look at the hat, look at the hairdo, look at the cut of the suit. Once, during the Peronist regime, Lana was visiting Argentina. And when she arrived at Buenos Aires Airport, customs took away all of her jewellery, be it real or costume, and kept it for hours as Lana waited. She later learned that Ava had instructed that every piece be photographed so that she could have replicas made for herself. But hey, I don't blame Ava for being influenced by Lana, who wouldn't be? I myself was influenced by Lana Turner's lifelong penchant for turbans. She wore so many of them, she may have been called Lana Turban. So now that we've looked at her career and her style, let's look at the lady herself and why I grew to love her as much as I did. Lana was a wonderful mother and a wonderful daughter. Here she is with daughter Cheryl when the latter was a toddler, and here she is shortly before her death, hand in hand with her beloved Cheryl. Lana found no conflict between being a mother and being a star. And although of course there were some ups and downs during Cheryl's teenage years due to rebellion, isn't that true of every mother and daughter? These two ladies adored each other, and Lana would eventually have another daughter. Cheryl's partner, now her wife, Josh Leroy. Lana always said Josh was her second daughter, and when Cheryl came out to her mother, Lana told her that she couldn't care less if she was gay or straight or whatever she was, as long as she was happy. And the same was true of Cheryl's father, Stephen Crane. Both accepted without hesitation, and both embraced the lovely Josh as their rightful daughter-in-law. I also said that Lana was a good daughter in her own right, didn't I? When Lana found fame, she took Mama with her, and here they both are, Lana and her mother Mildred having a girls' night out in a 1940s nightclub. And I love this photo, three generations of these beautiful ladies together. Yes, there were the occasional squabbles, but there was this strong familial bond, and it was one that Lana worked hard to maintain. Lana was also a great friend. Her bestie was Ava Gardner, both of whom endured Artie Shaw as a husband. She was also great pals with the Burtons, and this made sense to me because in many ways, although they're very different, Lana Turner reminds me of Elizabeth Taylor in this important way. Both women took their work very seriously, but they didn't take themselves so seriously that they couldn't laugh at themselves and stay grounded and down to earth. 
During World War II, Lana was a hard worker when it came to raising war bonds and was an active member of the USO Entertainment Corps. But what I didn't know is that Lana kept up her involvement with the USO and veteran societies for the rest of her life and totally unpublicized. Although she only had a little bit of high school before being discovered at the Top Hat drugstore, Lana was a cultured lady, self-taught and a big art collector. Her favorite genre was Mexican folk art. She was smart and she was kind and she was funny and she was down to earth and how could I not love somebody who carries her own condiments with her wherever she goes. Fact, Lana Turner carried a bottle of hot sauce around in her handbag in case she would be eating somewhere that didn't have any. And boy, can I relate to that because fact, I carry a little tub of horseradish sauce with me in my handbag just in case. Listen guys, restaurants don't have horseradish anymore. It's crazy. I can relate to this. It's no surprise that yellow was Lana's favorite color. For although life certainly handed her her fair share of tragedy and curveballs, she always picked herself up with her signature humor and positivity and believed that tomorrow would be better. And I love how much Lana enjoyed being a star, never a whiner about the Hollywood studio system or the lack of privacy or the demands of fans. Lana realized how lucky she was, how lucky she had been to be one of the very, very few girls who dreamed of stardom and actually got it. Was she perfect? Well, no, but who is? But she was one of the kindest, most hardworking, talented women of Hollywood who always tried her very, very best. Towards the end of her life, Lana spent a lot of time visiting Cheryl and Josh at their home in Hawaii. Evidently, what elderly Lana, resolutely single at this point, would do every day was to take a fold-out chair to the beach with a drink and a packet of her beloved cigarettes and just sit for hour upon hour, just staring at the ocean, remembering. And when she died in 1995 at the age of 74, Lana had a lot to remember. So, let's not forget her. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of 20th Century Style Icons here on The Ultimate Fashion History. I have lots more in that series. Here's just a few of them. So subscribe if you'd like to see more. Join that Facebook group. It really is a lot of fun. And I'll be back very soon with more here on The Ultimate Fashion History. So until then, thanks ever so much for watching. Take care and bye for now.